What's going on everyone? Jeremy here with the quartering and I'm going to try to break down the Star Citizen saga and response to the current community um, battle on whether or not it's a skamaz or it is legit. There is a lot of misinformation on both sides. A lot of this is in response to a recent Forbes article, which in general I think factually was correct but allowed itself to editorialize a little bit too much in order to paint the Star Citizen project as a failure, which I don't believe you can necessarily call it just that yet. It is not my intention at this point to shame anybody who's backed the project. It's not my intention to smear Star Citizen. I have spoken with or gotten comments from over 50 backers of the program. So I would say my research is in depth. Many backers are emotionally attached, which causes a lot of um, bad actors towards dissent and negative press. But it's important to remember that there is nearly 1 million backers, maybe more of this project at this point. So I'm not going to judge them all by the actions of just a few small zealots. Secondly, I am aware of a, a small subset of super fans, the cult of Star Citizen, I would call them. Um, they have a cult-like following uh, who have uh, issued threats to my fellow creators. Um, and I do know that while they do not represent the overwhelming amount of backers who just wanted a cool game and are excited about the possibility. Uh, it's come to my attention that the last time creators like Young Yeah or Sid Alpha, um, who had received threats to his family, Scott Manley, um, you know, these issues are not mine. I think you know my reputation. Uh, if people are upset by what is contained in this report, I suggest taking a breath before you do anything stupid. All right. Um, no one likes to report on this game because the community can be so vicious and vile. I've received several warnings from people who are fans of mine and also backers of Star Citizen reporting their own community, organizing behind the scenes to try and sway my opinion, and showed many examples of bad actors in the Star Citizen community uh, lashing out at commentators or news coverage. I'm going to present the information that has been presented through several articles, as well as read verbatim response responses from several Star Citizen backers. I'm going to do the best I can to give a fair shake to this. I know there will be people that come and auto dislike this video from the Star Citizen community, but I hope that you'll listen to it and that you'll understand that I am trying to be objective here and that my viewers will probably remember at this moment to smash that thumbs up button to counteract an incoming wave of hate. Now, originally the crowdfunder uh, was around making two games, a single player as well as an online game. Uh, and some of the comments I've seen around it, I want to just debunk right away. Uh, I saw a fellow creator refer to Star Citizen as a Ponzi scheme or a scam. Um, to use that terminology is to basically openly admit you don't understand what those two words mean. The game in its current state is playable. You can log in right now as a backer and play the game. They provide regular updates. As I've said, there are many misunderstandings and there are also people willing to report on this project without doing their proper due diligence. Uh, these are things that I will also cover. Now, I am on record as saying they are obviously way over budget, way over their time schedule. And I do have genuine concerns that the backers of this game will ever get what they were promised. In the Forbes article, they talk about the history of freelancer, wing commander, and make some allegations of misappropriation of funds, some sketchy fundraising methods that were technically illegal in Germany, but I'm not a lawyer, so I'm going to focus on the game itself. There are many issues or charges made by the Forbes document that I want to bring up to you and then give the Star Citizen community their chance to counter that and share with you my final opinion on what's going on with this game. First of all, some of the big 
uh, takeaways from the article was uh, there is some questioning around funding. From what I understand is the game, according to uh, community fundraising development, community run spreadsheet has raised somewhere around 220 million. They have also received 46 million from an outside investor, Clive Calder, a South African billionaire behind Jive Records and his son, Keith. Um, the funds are meant for marketing. Now, that is what Forbes claims. Um, they have also claimed that Star Citizen has burned through nearly all 300 million already and share statements from the creator saying things like nobody is obligated to buy more than just the starter ship. Uh, all of the marketing is done by the fans virally and a lot of ships are because the community has asked for them. Now, this is in reference to the uh, fact that they have ships that are in game, by the way, these are in game items that cost more than a thousand dollars. Okay. That is not a micro transaction. That is a macro transaction. Um, I don't think that you can, in my opinion, I don't think you can just say, well, I'm not responsible for what people buy. Now I want to talk about some of the proclamations that the Forbes article put out there that are probably factually correct, but I want to remove a little bit of their editorial flavor so that we can discuss it here individually. They talked about the FTC and how they had received 129 complaints related to Cloud Imperium Gaming involving requests for refund. Some of them as high as $24,000. If you've put 24 grand into a game, you're too far. Uh, this is what I would see as a problem. Uh, now, if you're a multimillionaire, whatever, I don't know that person's individual you know, financial situation, but um, if they had that kind of money and didn't care about it, I doubt they'd be filing requests to refund from the FTC. Now, I will say this, a company should issue refunds whenever possible, even if it's outside of the realm of their predetermined or pre-agreed to refund date. You're talking about in all honesty, a very small number of complaints, 129 out of over 1 million. I mean, the law of averages tells you that if a million people buy something, some percentage of them are going to be dissatisfied. Some percentage of them are just going to be crazy. Uh, some percentage of them are going to be scammers. Um, so to have 129, it sounds like a lot, but when you consider the number of complaints or uh, total backers to complaints, it's a very small percentage. That said, I 100% uh, believe Cloud Imperium Games should just refund these people and move on with their life. Keeping money from disgruntled customers is not uh, a good look. They also talk about some very concerning numbers around the salary bloat that this company has and issues that I legitimately have a problem with that I'm going to share with you now. They shared that the average or the annual salary expenditure for this company is $30 million dollars. However, in those documents, they did not disclose how much the president and his other family members or close friends on the board are being paid. This is concerning. Robert says he is compensated like a typical C-suite game executive, which to me sounds like he's paying himself way too much money. You know, when you have a big cushy job at Activision or EA, you can draw that salary and not be hurting the production. But if you are running a Kickstarter, okay, a crowdfunding source, you don't pay yourself a gigantic salary. If you want to pay yourself a living wage, I think that's reasonable. But I think you want to wait till the game is out before you cash in personally. I think that's a really bad look that you haven't shared that publicly. And I'm guessing there's probably a reason for it. Imagine if he's paying himself five to $10 million a year to be an executive of a company that is being crowdfunded. What would you think if you were a backer? Are you crowdfunding a gigantic salary for the creator of that product? I look at exclusivelygames.com, by the way, which is running a killer contest right now. We're giving away three game consoles and 10 video games. You want to check that out. Video link in the description. Uh, I have not paid myself a dime of that crowdfunding money, and I am highly likely never to. That's not how you're supposed to run a crowdfunder. I mean, I get it that you've 
uh, needed to, you need to pay your bills, but you need to figure out a way around that. You should have hired someone else, maybe paid yourself less salary. I don't know, but you know, they have 537 employees at Cloud Imperium working at five offices around the world. And that forces Roberts to constantly need to raise money because he's constantly burning through cash. There are some topics I didn't care for in the Forbes article, like uh, they sort of alluded to Robert's new home purchase in 2018, but that's a load of BS. I think the implication is he's spending backer money to buy this house, but the reality is he had plenty of money before this crowdfunder, so I don't think there's really any evidence that he used Kickstarter funds to buy a home. You're allowed to live your life, even though you're having a crowdfunder, you're allowed to make purchases. I think Forbes put it in there to plant a seed of doubt or to make an implication that he was using those funds for that. I don't like that. Um, some of the other things is around the game's functionality. Um, is it anything like what was promised? No, but there has been times where um, he quotes in the article that as many as 40,000 people had been in and playing the game at one time. Uh, and that doesn't sound like vaporware to me. That doesn't sound like um, a, a, a Ponzi scheme. It sounds like what we have here is major, major mismanagement. Some of the most shocking data. Star Citizen is a playable game. Roberts insists it has more functionality and content than a lot of finished games. He adds that 40,000 people played together online over a recent week. And that criticism of Card Imperium's development work is mostly fueled by online trolls. This is not a good reply either. If you just say the criticism is invalid because my trolls, that tells me you're not taking criticism seriously. And when you talk about in this article at one point at the end of 2017, they were down to only $14 million in the bank. By the way, this is a company that's burning through $30 million in salary every year. That's not even enough money to make it six months. And that's just with your salary. That doesn't include marketing costs. It doesn't include data usage costs, servers, keeping the lights on, all these other expenses. So at one point, I'm guessing they were just weeks from having to shutter. Now they did raise more money, but the question is, was that a good investment? It sounds like Roberts to me is grossly micromanaging this project and he needs to step aside. Former employees also say that Roberts gets involved in the smallest details and pushes huge and complex investments in areas that are not worth the effort. Now that's their opinion. At one point, one of the company's senior graphic engineers was ordered by Roberts to spend months through several iterations getting visual effects of ship shields just right. In addition, workers have had to spend weeks on end making demos so the Cloud Imperium can keep selling spaceships and raising money. That's the problem I, I see here ultimately is raising more money is not fixing the problem. Um, it's only allowing the problem to continue to exist. I believe this game can get concluded and delivered pretty close to as promised, but I also believe it's going to take almost $1 billion. That's what I think it's going to take. If they really want to deliver what they said they're delivering, um, you're going to be at this current clip. They're going to have to burn through almost a billion dollars and another five to 10 years to do it. To put things in perspective, okay, now, again, Star Citizen fans, relax. I will give you your say. I have it right in front of me on a script. To put things in perspective, a game that has spent over $300 million already, here are some budgets of some other popular games. Grand Theft Auto V, $265 million. By the way, that includes marketing costs. So the development costs were $137 million. Now, some Star Citizen people accurately point out, hey, they had already built the engine for Grand Theft Auto. That's fair. How about Star Wars Old Republic? $200 million. How about Destiny? Production cost? 60 million. How about, I don't know, Tomb Raider? How about that? 
Square Enix, $100 million. Final Fantasy VII. I mean, you're talking about, I mean, no game in the in on this list has really topped more than $300 million in production cost. Like, not even close. The most expensive game of all time, according to this list I'm looking at, is Grand Theft Auto V. Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2, $250 million. And again, here's the funny thing. When you look at Call of Duty, they... They spent $50 million on development and $200 million on marketing for a grand total of $250 million, okay? So get out of here with, but it's it's going to be great. There's major problems, okay? Um, you know, And at one point, Robert said the release date of Squadron 42, which is the offline, uh, would be the fall of 2015 with a full commercial version of Star Citizen coming out in 2016. Since then, Robert now says the beta version of Squadron 42 will come out in 2020. Now, development, one thing that a lot of people point out is, well, this was crowdfunded in like 2012, so it's been seven years. I think development in earnest, as people said, has started in 2015. So they are four years into development. If you look at how long it took to deliver Anthem and other projects, I would say they're probably on pace. I think they're spending way too much time on marketing, and I'm going to show you um, kind of some of the effects of the expenses, and then I'm going to show you um, the rebuttals of some of the Star Citizen fans that I also interviewed. Uh, if we look at the effect, uh, essentially Star Citizen has many ways to generate revenue, whether it's ship upgrades or it's joining their... Um, basically their Patreon for video content. Um, and they have been relatively transparent in terms of their financials. Um, I think there is a propensity for people to gloss over this fact. Uh, you see, you know, essentially each year they have pledges, which is coming from their Kickstarter, I imagine. Um, then you have subscriptions uh, and then you have other incomes, which is includes incentives, partnerships and others. So you're talking about a game that, and, and by the way, they had their best year in 2018. If we look at the way, uh, this is how their backers, you know, this is a community, uh, a community managed sheet. So if you look at the money they raised just in 2018, okay, if we just look at 2018, total in December, total in 2018, 37 million dollars. More than ever. But you do get stories like this. When Kickstarter first launched in 2012, backers were given an estimated release date of 2014. The game has since ballooned, promising new content and features, and is still far from complete. With the addition of spaceships with Cloud Imperium selling in many different models for as much as $3,000 each, funds for Star Citizen have only increased, but the game seemingly no closer to actually coming out. That is a lie. So... If you're in the know and you follow the, the Kickstarter, they have regular updates coming out. People can actually play the game. Uh, I wouldn't say that that's a reasonable statement. Many backers have looked for ways to reclaim their money, but not many would continue to buy expensive spaceships while seeking refunds for the $4,500 they've already spent. One backer, Ken Lord, apparently did. It seems odd to spend thousands of dollars on DLC for a game that's not out yet or may never come out, but it's all together. Not altogether Mr. Lord's fault. Yes, it is. It is. It absolutely is his fault. Ken Lord, a 39-year-old data scientist who suffers from worsening multiple sclerosis, that's not relevant, originally backed Star Citizen in 2013 and went on to spend over $4,500 on spaceships, which he unsuccessfully sued Clar Imperium in 2018 to get a refund for. However, he claims to also suffer from poor impulse control. After his refund bid failed, you take something like that as bad, like spending too much money in a video game, he says, uh, and turn it into a socially exclusive club and makes it desirable. Cheers to their marketing department. Uh, he also, Star Citizen has been fascinating. He went on to continue to buy more products, even after losing the lawsuit. So there is a fanatical level of support for this game that I don't think I'll ever understand. Uh, However, here is what some Star Citizen backers told me. 
that the current moons and planets are massive. They're actually one tenth the size of actual Earth. The same backer went on to inform me that the size and scope of the project has changed over the years with the support of the actual backers. When you look at something like promising 100 star systems, that number is based on assumptions from the start of development when they plan to make a lot less detailed planets, which would be generally inaccessible other than a few specific landing zones that they would have required you to autopilot down to them. And sure, they aren't as full of gameplay content currently, but that's coming along. They go on to say, I never see this game get a fair shake it deserves. Is it taking longer than we'd like? Yes. There's not a single person who would tell you no. It's not too long of a wait. And there and are things I don't like. For one, I don't like combat. It's too broken for my liking this patch. patch and I wish I th they would fix it. There's not a doubt in my mind that this game will get done. I actually think the last bits required to make it fully functional to Chris's visions will be in some point in 2020. The speculation, but educated speculation. I, of course, really want it to succeed. Of course, I've spent money, but I've also invested a lot of time and I've made really good friends. And so far, I really enjoyed myself with the game, including IRL activities. While the Forbes, Ar Forbes article was technically accurate, they presented it in a way that was very misleading with horribly outdated information and attaching negative connotation to everything. I wouldn't disagree with that. The 100 star systems, for example, dates back to the original idea from 2012, where those star systems would only have small landing zones. Um, as I recall, only 80%, 80% voted to expand the scope. Now, Cloud Imperium, after hiring a lot of ex-Crytek employees who quit Crytek because they weren't getting paid, Crytek was able to create tech for seamless transition and full rotating planetary bodies with the ability to land anywhere things change. The scope increased, and instead of a minimal effort game, we've seen so many publishers crap out. What he wanted to do is push the gaming industry forward without having a publisher just looking at dollar signs. Now, I think that's reasonable. Backer also goes on to say, of course, there are downsides to that. Chris Roberts is a perfectionist and a dreamer with a tendency to micromanage as well as changing his mind a lot. However, somewhere around 2017, things really started flowing and moving forward in a coherent fashion. Most likely, this is due to him setting up producers and managers in different offices to handle matters on his behalf. He still wants to sign off on everything, but at least he now has producers and managers keeping things on course. Lastly, a lot of detractors and trolls keep talking about how it's been eight years from the claim to development in 2011. They hold up some sort of interview where Chris mentioned it. However, a quick Kickstarter campaign ended in November 2012. By February 2013, Cloud Imperium consisted of 10 guys in a basement with nothing but a dream and a demo. So they had to build up the company first, and they didn't hit the ground running with 500 people from the get-go. Unlike an established AAA development studios who can allocate hundreds of people and funds from the start. Cloud Imperium is also working on two games simultaneously, the MMO Star Citizen and the single player game Squadron 42. So I think that the truth lies somewhere in the middle. <clears throat> there are fanatical fans of this game. There are passive fans of this game, and there are people that have moved on. Ultimately, what can be done? I think they need to bring in a finisher, somebody that's going to make the tough cuts, that are going to push things forward because I think in the first side of things, the first 80% of development, there was just too much changing minds. Every time you change your mind, it's very expensive. When you micromanage, it gets very expensive. Now, if the backers are willing to continue to back this, there's no reason. I don't think this project, I think this project can't be done, but I do think the scope and cost is going to greatly exceed 500 million. And I think to deliver the final product, we are legitimately looking at our first billion dollar game. Now, at the end of that, they will have a studio essentially built around supporting the game for the fans that enjoy it. And if that game grows to a million, two million, three million, four million players, it could still, I still think there's a small percentage chance that this could really be something amazing. However, mismanagement, micromanagement, overspending, and hiding some important details. Like, I really want to know what the CEO is making of a company that I kickstarted. Imagine if I were paying myself 50 grand a year out of the exclusively games crowdfunder. I don't think my backers would appreciate that. But 
the infrastructure is built, the staff is on hand, and Cloud Imperium Games really needs to get things going. I don't think you can look back at the past and shed tears over the mistakes that you've made. You've got to go and correct them going forward, and that's what they need to do. They need to go out and get somebody who's going to get this thing done, like what BioWare did. They're going to have to cut scope. They're going to have to be more realistic with what they're going to deliver their backers. But everything that I've read on it, and you know, in terms of you know, Star Citizen burned through their 240 million. Well, okay, but that headline implies that they've offered nothing for it. Now, the game is in what I would still consider an alpha state. It is not as far along as it needs to be for the money that's been invested, but they need and they need to make some huge leaps and bounds going forward here. And Chris needs to get more transparent with how they're spending their money. They need to focus less time on milking their existing audience. Maybe look for a big time VC guy to come in there and give them a big chunk of money. Stop selling $3,000 ships when your game isn't even done yet. I think that's a PR disaster. But you got to remember that only 1% to 2% of these million people are the one that are buying it. And the overwhelming majority of these people just wanted a cool game. And overall, as bad as Star Citizen has been, I don't feel comfortable calling it a scam or a Ponzi scheme. I would feel comfortable calling it horribly mismanaged, late, bloated, and in need of somebody with real industry experience who can come in and deliver this product to the people that have put their time and money into it. I hope you enjoyed what is now probably the longest video I've ever made. If you made it to the end, make sure that you click that thumbs up button. It really helps the channel grow. I appreciate all of you. If you uh, want to continue the conversation in the comment section down below. I'm sure there'll be many Star Citizen fans to talk to down there. I hope you enjoyed this video. We'll talk to you again real soon.